Staying with the South Korean leader's state visit to Beijing, there's a number of topics to address high on his priority list. North Korea issues, of course. Our Moon Gun Young turned to Kevin Rudd, the former Prime Minister of Australia and a longtime China expert, for his take on ways to draw support from President Xi Jinping in managing the current tensions brought about by the regime. Uh, Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister of Australia and President of Asia Society, thank you so much for speaking to us today. It's good to be back in Seoul and uh, good to be back in the ROK. You've um, set the possibility of a military conflict in the Korean Peninsula up from a 5% from your previous estimate to maybe 25%. Historically, it's always been around 5%. That is, something could happen. I think what's changed materially is the rapid nature of the progress of the North Korean nuclear program. And secondly, because you begin to cross American red lines about what they can tolerate in terms of the ICBM risk to themselves. And there is a form of unilateral US military action against the North. I don't believe we can rule that possibility out. In fact, I think it's a growing possibility, but not a probability. You've looked at this issue for, from many different angles for many, many years um, in many different positions as well. Now, in the interest of the great cliche, you know, never waste a great crisis, what are some dynamics that need to change yours? I think one of the key challenges in dealing with um, the North Korean uh, nuclear weapons program is how do you uh, make it clear to our Chinese friends that there are real opportunities? which proceed from this current difficulty. Can you turn the armistice into a peace treaty? Can you uh, also uh, look at uh, credible external security guarantees by the Chinese, by the Russians, by the Americans for the future of the North Korean regime? Uh, can you even long term, if all these things work, look at a, uh, the beginning of a reduction in the US military presence on the peninsula? Now, I regard all those things as opportunities for China. Um, speaking of China, South Korean President Moon Jae-in um, will be sitting down with his Chinese counterpart in Beijing. The U.S. and South Korea have been pressing China to do more to rein in North Korea. But some have begun casting doubt on how much leverage China actually has over North Korea. Or more importantly, how much are they willing to use that leverage? Well, of course, those are two different questions. On the actual leverage the Chinese have, um, uh, it begins with the letter O and ends with the letter L, and the middle letter is I, and it's called oil. 90% of its oil imports come from China. Uh, and we also know the importance of oil in keeping the wheels of the North Korean military machine literally turning. Mm -hmm. So China has considerable leverage on this question. If you spend time in Beijing talking to our Chinese friends, they will ask a series of questions. They'll say, one, uh, why should we do this? You want us to effectively assist in the toppling of a regime in North Korea and not knowing what would replace it. Well, does that point in the direction of Korean unification but on South Korean terms or American terms, thereby presenting us in China with uh, a difficult geopolitical neighbour? Right. So I think um, it's very important to deal with the substance of each of those concerns. Uh, President Moon um, looks at this also as an opportunity to understand the full breadth of China's own national priorities, including its domestic priorities. Where is its economy going? What about the problem of the deleveraging of its financial institutions and its state-owned enterprises? The reason I suggest those things is that for me that has always been helpful in dealing with Chinese leaders to understand the broader world they're coming from. Each of us has got priorities. China has been calling for a freeze for freeze or dual suspension. South Korea is considering it. However, it has said that it's not something that is on its table for now. The U.S., on the other hand, is not for that idea at all. What is your view? Um, I understand the logic about freeze because, um, let's face it, the dynamic factor here is North Korea. Mm -hmm. They're acquiring a weapons capability that didn't exist before, which is inherently definitionally destabilizing. I think because the North Koreans have actually themselves changed the status quo, it's a reasonable principle to adopt that they must take the first step. 
uh, in freezing what they do, mm. which means freezing the, the nuclear weapons program and freezing the ballistic missile program. It's also important that these are done in a way where what's on the agenda for a freeze affects both the United States and the ROK equally. Mm. Uh, I'm, always, I'm always a little sceptical about a freeze only in an ICBM program because that affects the Americans. But not South Korea. But not the ROK and not Japan. So I'd be looking at a freeze on both um, ballistic missile testing and on the acquisition of nuclear material. So if there is a first step forward, which is a, let's call it a double freeze by the, ROK, by the um, DPRK, uh, then it's really important that other countries in the six party talks sign on to that as well. Mm -hmm. So that if there is a breach by the North, and they've breached these things before, everyone is locked in, not just the ROK and the North. All right. Um, Kevin Red, always a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you so much for your time today. We'll be back in Korea.